I like the Hollywood productions. Well, well of the Bible, anyways. <laughs> Although I did watch Avatar. That was kind of cool. But you see, I enjoy lots of different varieties of inspiration because they always take me to the designation that I want them to go. Because I structured my mind in a certain way. I made my life a pattern into a format that no matter what I put into it, it still comes out the same way. It's like putting a style sheet. If you know computer lingo and you know understand what's going on, then you know how sometimes that you've gone to a website, you know, and you know you maybe you worked at work, you know, and no matter how you typed in the words, they always kept popping up in the same font, the same size. It's because underneath what you couldn't see was a style sheet that no matter what you did to that, that style sheet made you see only what it wanted you to see. And that's what a style sheet does. It will change the input into what God wants for the output. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is like a style sheet, so to speak. He's inscribed in your heart this style sheet that's going to automatically, whatever you put in, change it. That he's going to take it and make it into something he can use. The same way that the Holy Spirit takes your prayers, you know, that you offer up to heaven, and he has a style sheet that he listens and goes, no, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm going to groan instead. I'm sorry, your whining's gotten too much, you know, I'm going to groan. <clears throat> and, you know, by golly, God understands. He understands your prayers because that's what most of our prayers are, just a bunch of groaning before God. <laughs> but that applies as it may. But the reality of having that style sheet so impressed me that I realized that that's what God had done in my life with most of the things that I saw. Not everything, because a lot of things are, you know, like, you know, put on, you know, the horses things, you know, keep my eyes focused straight. But a lot of inspiration, you know, inspires me towards God. And I use that in order to be inspired and point myself in the right direction. A lot of times the movies like movie Jesus, you know, that was a good movie. I enjoyed it. It was written by, I guess, some some guys that wanted to make the pictorial Bible, you know, like the Bible in movies, you know. So they did Jesus. They did it pretty accurate, you know, Luke. And, but my favorite movies, believe it or not, my number ones and number twos, you know, my favorite movie of all time, Scottsville. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Who, me? Godspell? Put an S there. <laughs> But, uh, no, really, you know, give me an afro and I'd be thrilled. <laughs> I got hair. But Godspell demonstrated the movie, to me, the greatest revelation of what Jesus was like in the teachings that he gave. I went, ooh, I get it, I get it, I get it, I got it, ooh, cool. And to me, there was like, man, it didn't get any better than this, and I just get thrilled over it. I'm still singing it every day. You know, I'll wake up in the morning and say, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. You know, big old Broadway production for me, you know, waking up. <laughs> you know, and I go run it out, you know, and dive in some pool, you know, somewhere. Yeah, let's get cleaned up. <laughs> Woo! Cool. You know, for me, Godspell was like, it was it. Then along came Jesus of Nazareth. That's my number two, by the way. Jesus of Nazareth was like, and every time, you know, it used to come on at Easter, they'd play, you know, like a commercial break, they'd play the long music intro, the <laughs> beginning of the show, the long music intro, the end of the show, the long music intro. The music really got to you after a while. It's like, <gasps> and by the time Jesus died, you're like, ah! you know, dying. But those movies inspired me. You know, they, they formulated an image that I have, a realization of a picture of how I imagine Jesus to be. The actual person that reveals himself to me, I also have trained myself to expect, you know, probably a great shock that he probably won't look like what I think him to be. And that's one of the things that most people don't realize is that some of our devotionals teach us to remember that God goes beyond our comprehension. The Son of Man, Jesus himself, as he walked on the earth, always with his disciples, 
went beyond their comprehension. He kept expanding outward their capabilities to comprehend exactly what it was he was doing because he was trying to break down some of the barriers that they had formulated based upon tradition, education, occupation, and where they were lo located you know, in the earth as far as you know, being in that culture at that time, in that place. I would have said interlocation, interlocution, but you know, the point being is that they were at that time only so able to comprehend what little bit they wanted to see because they were always having in the back of their minds what they wanted him to be. So they only saw what they wanted to see, not what he was trying to reveal to them. And that's why the book of Revelation is so interesting in that it reveals Jesus. That's what the book of Revelation is called. The revelation of Jesus. That's what it is. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what you think of it as. You know, it's like end times or the end of the world or Armageddon and all that stuff. But it's really the revelation of Jesus. That's what the first line is. You know, and the book's called. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave it to his servants that he should reveal to the things that, you know, are going to happen, blah, blah, blah. To his servant John, you know, blah, blah. And so, the point being is that God revealed himself we tend to inspire ourselves. We have, each and every one of us, a vision or an idea of what we think Jesus looks like. But you know, until we see him face to face, we really don't know. And it's going to be a little bit of a shock, you know, I hope. I hope it's going to cause us to fall down or bend the knee or do something, you know. But I think it's going to cause us to, like John said, bam, flat on our face and, whoa, is me. I'm a man undone. Because we'll be in the presence of the Son. You know, oh yeah, we're, we'll want to hug him and kiss him. At least I hope you do, because it says kiss the Son unless you be angry. Don't pretend like it's a Judas thing. You should kiss the Son. But the, the point being is that he ain't going to be kissable. He's going to look like a lamb that was slain. So it's going to be kind of like, ew, okay, you said so. But, or like, what is it, LL Kutik? <laughs> it's kind of a cool thing. Uh, you know, kiss your fingers. You know. Anyways, but the point is, kiss the sun lest you be angry. Is the, what the proverb says, and the reality of the love that we have for him expresses ourselves in the way that we see Jesus is based lots of times upon our love for him. Some people see him differently and they don't necessarily have an accurate picture of him, but that's the same thing that's true about our Father in heaven. Jesus came to reveal not just himself and be the revelation of himself. But he came to reveal the Father in the flesh. Not just God alone being, you know, the Son, and the Son being revealed in the fact that Jesus is, you know, God, and he is the Son, and he's the second part of the Trinity that we call, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But that also, he is the direct physical manifestation of God, the Father. If you want to see the Father, look at Jesus. If you want to see the Spirit, look at Jesus. That's what you see. Sorry. That's the way it works. <laughs> oh well. But my point is, our perspective of Jesus, our realization of Jesus, and our observation of Jesus will always be changing and expanding, not shrinking by contrast. Contrast can cause different colors to be highlighted, different light to come in and affect the camera, like I'm sure right now it's probably being affected because the sun's coming up and there's sun coming over the trees and it's going to hit the camera just right and it's going to make it all kind of blurry. But the contrast can be adjusted, but God is always wanting to just envelop us in the full revelation of who he is, not what we think he is or what we want him to be. And so when we look at utmost, have you seen Jesus? After that he appeared in another form to two of them. Mark 16, 12. Being saved and seeing Jesus are not the same thing. Many people who have never seen Jesus have received and share in God's grace. But once you have seen him, you can never be the same. Other things will not be and not have the appeal they did before. You should always recognize the difference between what you see Jesus to be and what he has done for you. If you only see what he has done for you, your God is not big enough. But if you have had a vision seeing Jesus as he really is, 
experiences can come and go, yet you will endure as seeing him who is invisible. Hebrews 11.27 The man who was blind from birth did not know who Jesus was until Jesus appeared and revealed himself to him. See John 9. Jesus appears to those for whom he has done something, but we cannot order or predict when he will come. He may appear suddenly at any turn, at any moment. He may just step right out and start talking. <laughs> Might even walk with you for a while. He may appear suddenly and then say, Now I see him, as in John 9.25. Jesus must appear to you and to your friend individually. No one can see Jesus with your eyes, and you can't see Jesus for someone else. And division takes place when one has seen him and the other has not. You cannot bring your friend to the point of seeing. God must do it. Have you seen Jesus? If so, you will want others to see him too. And if they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Mark 16, 13. When you see him, you must tell even if you, they don't believe. One of the things that I found interesting is that in my Vidivo series, you know, that's what Vidivo is all about in a way about seeing Jesus, but hearing Jesus is that the whole bottom line underneath everything that the Vidivo ministry is, is that I heard Jesus talk directly to me. Yes, in my ear, I mean, not in my ear, you know, to put it bluntly on the telephone, but you know, the point is God spoke and Jesus spoke to me and he carried on a conversation and it wasn't about anything that anyone would have known. No one could have guessed what I needed to hear or talk to me the way that he talked to me. No one could have understood the things that I was just arguing with my co-worker before the phone rang. Nobody knew I was going to be at work that day because I was not scheduled for work. I was the assistant manager there. And no one knew what my aggravations of my heart were because I was keeping them inside, kind of like Mary thing, you know, kind of doing one of those things where I was like wrestling with God, you know, and saying, God, you know, I don't know where I fit, you know, I don't fit in your kingdom. And I kept using the word, you know, there's no place for me in your kingdom because everybody else was pastors and elders and deacons and I just didn't fit, it seemed like. So all these things kept going on and on and on, you know, and it was like, you know, all these things that I look back on and I could list it and say, you know, no way, you know, I mean, to put it bluntly, no way. You know, there was all these things that Jesus said to me that were like, bam, 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 bam. Absolutely impossible for just by circumstances. Then, the witness of the Spirit. At that point in time when I was there at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, when I was, you know, still going to the Bible studies every day and I was living with a bunch of Christian roommates, man, I was walking in the Spirit and I was talking in the Spirit and I was doing all kinds of things that I could trust in the Holy Spirit inside of my life. And everything that was inside me was going, you know, and I could just tell, you know, it's like, yeah, I knew. But when Jesus spoke, <gasps> there was nothing inside me. I was emptied. I went, and it was so awesome. It was like, <gasps> and I knew later that, of course, that when Jesus spoke, the Spirit was not there for me to go. Because I was reaching inside me trying to say, man, is this a joke? Is this phony? Is this fake? Is this, you know, like somebody trying to pull my leg? And that's when the words came to me. Do you believe me? I went, <gasps> Hi, you know, how did the voice know? How did the person on the line, how could this be a crank phone call? What kind of crank phone call? Who's who's so weirdo that could possibly, you know, anticipate, you know, my thought process and all these things? So I was going through all this stuff, you know, at the same time that I was talking to Jesus. But the point is, I was talking to Jesus. You know, it wasn't like the song Shock and Angel where it says, you know, I got Jesus on the line and he's going to take you all the line, you know, every step of the way. This was real. <laughs> it was like, oh. And, you know, I thought everybody else did, too. You know, maybe not on the phone, but, you know, talk personally. And later, Jesus spoke to me directly, too, in other ways and other circumstances and has ever since. But my point is, Vidivo has always been about and directly about the realization of that scripture that God said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. They will not follow the voice of another. That God always intended you to hear him. From Genesis through Revelation, it was always about a direct relationship that should be progressing to the point where you could look up and see Jesus in the clouds, or you could look up and see Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, or you could be sitting here and Jesus could appear and start talking to you, as he has with some. Whether in the body or not, who knows? I don't know. But the point is, Paul did it. Why not you? People do it. Why not you?
happened in the Jesus movement? Happens every day. Why not you? The point is, why not you? Are you so enamored with love for your Father, for God, for Jesus, that you are pursuing as a deer that's panting after the waters, hard after God, in pursuit of God, as A.W. Tozer said? Are you really desperate to see Jesus? Are you so wanting to have that experience of knowing Jesus, not because you want to hear and say and tell everyone, oh boy, I know, because believe me, once you've heard Jesus, you're not going to run around telling a lot of people about it. Oh, you'll tell some, but they won't believe you. And you might even have doubts afterwards. <laughs> Although, it's kind of hard to deny. <laughs> you just can't deny it. <laughs> it's like if someone comes up to me and says, you know, if they ever ask, they don't ask me that question because they know better. <laughs> you know, it's like, don't ask me about Jesus, I'll tell you. But, you know, if someone came up and said, you ever heard Jesus speak? Yep. I mean, I even put it on the internet. You know, somebody says, hey, I don't care what you do, but just, did Jesus tell you to do it? Not. Don't do it. You know, bluntly. And that's the fact of the matter. I depend upon my relationship with God in such a way that, you know, I'm him that depended upon God in my relationship with him directly to say, hey, huh, what do you want? I'm waiting. Hello, come on, let's get with it. Come on, I don't hear nothing. Now, I do read the Word, you know. I read the Bible. I, obviously, with video, you know, you can tell because I'm doing like, you know, 20 devotionals a day, maybe not that many. But, you know, we study and, you know, the Scriptures are made applicable and they're quickened to us as we read through the Scriptures. And some people, as they do it dogmatically or traditionally through a set, organized, you know, format that they use, whether it be, you know, one-year Bible or three years or five years through the Bible, or they use some Torah-inspired, you know, rabbinical way of looking at the, you know, the entire Haftarah and the Torah, you know, and reading parts and pieces and putting it all together and trying to accumulate and culminate in some way that God's speaking, you know, and directing your life. Or, you know, it's circumstantial. Some people live by the circumstances of their life that God is directing the circumstances in such a way that he's coordinating them so that they would at least be funneled kind of like a mass herd, you know, of a bunch of cattle when you want to steer them, you know, you got to kind of do the outriders, you know, on the horses, you know, kind of steering them in the right direction so that they're heading the right direction they don't run off the cliff. You know, or like sheepdogs, you know, that go to after the individual sheep that's running off, you know, kind of steers them back into the flock, you know. All those things. You know, God uses any way he can. Even a donkey. <laughs> So, quite frankly, Vidivo has always been about hearing God and knowing His voice. My sheep hear my voice and I know Him. And you should not stop your personal relationship development with God until you do. Period. Ever. As a matter of fact, you should never stop your personal development relationship with God at all. But some people do. So, seeing Jesus is obviously one of the steps of also knowing Jesus, and it's something that we should all be after. Let me see you, Moses said. And he says, but you can't see me, you'll die. You know, but you can see my after parts. You know? Which I'm not quite sure if that was kind of like God had his pants hanging down, some of these people walk around the street do. But I don't think so. So, don't think that's what the after parts are. <laughs> I think it was more like his train filled the temple and the glory that went by was kind of like the glory of God, you know, and he saw the afterglory, so to speak, kind of like an afterglow. Whoa, the first afterglow, the afterparts. But my point is, in all these things, you don't read a Bible unless you want to know God. You don't study the scriptures unless you want to know God. You don't go to church unless you want to go. You don't should you should not be a Christian unless you want to know God. Because if you don't want to know God, get out. You're wasting your time. You know, it's stupid. It's really dumb. Because you're not going to wind up where you think you are. You're not going to make it to heaven and somehow you know escape hell just because, you know, you think you can shine it, you know, or you know, hide inside of what everybody else is doing. No. You gotta want to know God. You gotta want to know him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You gotta want to love him because once you do find him, oh man, you're gonna want to tell everybody about it. Seriously. And that's why we do what we do. And that's why this ministry has always been about hearing God. As Upmost just told us that we should also want to see God. And you know, bottom line is, once you do, once you've heard from him, You're without excuse. That's one thing for sure. But it's also one of the most awesome experiences you're ever going to have. 